thank you all very much for coming along and joining us today. And uh, okay, oh, Hannah was very loud, but um, hopefully the sound is okay now and we'll get started with practicing what you preach. And I'd like to start off with just a few words about uh, why this session came about. And basically, it's the result of these two things you see here. here. It was an ELT chat uh, based on the article that you can see below. And if you'd like to just click on that link or, or copy and paste it for later on, it's really interesting reading. Uh, basically, I was seeing uh, a lot of conflicting viewpoints, really, uh, in the staff room and in teachers' meetings. The views that teachers were expressing didn't always correspond very well to what I was seeing in observation. Uh, and I began to wonder if perhaps I was doing the same thing too. Maybe what I thought I was doing wasn't actually the case. And so uh, it's led me to this little exploration. Uh, today, it's all about me, I'm afraid, but hopefully uh, it'll inspire you to take this, uh, this process away and make it all about you, about your learners and your teaching. So first up, uh, we'll be looking at uh, some of my well, some of your beliefs as well. We're going to kick off with some polls and uh, see what you think on a various on various different matters. Then I'm going to uh, talk you through my my teaching career roller coaster, if you like, uh, and then my top ten teaching beliefs. We're going to then take a look at a video of me in action, which is a bit frightening, and uh, then do my beliefs measure up to my practice, and if not, what ways are they there to redress this balance? So let's kick off with some polls. Now, uh, thanks to Anya Shaw, who's with us here today as well. Uh, she has very kindly sent me a handout with all of these wonderful teaching and learning statements on them. And we're going to send this out at the end of the session if you'd like to download it and look at them because there are about 25 or 30 of these wonderful statements here. Uh, so our first one, I believe in the validity of care and group work and always seems to be a very popular answer right now. Almost always. Also feel free to comment in the chat box here. Um, when might care or group work not be a valid option? When might we want to avoid using pair or group work? Okay, yeah, exam practice is a very valid reason to avoid this. You can't have them sharing their answers if you want them to, to test their ability. Student preferences as well, and that the right to work alone, or perhaps there are activities where we'd prefer them to work alone, at least first, before then sharing their thoughts and ideas. Thinking time, another excellent idea. Um, presentations. Special education needs students, an excellent point as well. Um, there are a number of times when we may want a very good dynamic, and on occasion too, we might even want to teach. Um, I think in recent recent thinking, we're discouraged from you know, taking this teacherly role. But there may be times for some teacher-centred teacher presentation as well. OK, let's move on to our second poll. Um, it is, I prioritise eliciting over telling. Okay, it started off with the always, but now we've gone down to an almost always there as well. So far, no rarelys or nevers, um, but we all seem to be very much on the same page at this point. Um, why is eliciting a good thing? Why is it better than telling? It, that, this would seem to be our, our belief here. The P word. Mm -hmm. 
participation, that students are not just the empty vessel waiting to receive our words of wisdom. Yeah, thinking enables them to remember it. Okay, and getting your students' attention, we'll be talking about that a little later on as well, and I, I look forward to hearing some of the ways that you get your students' attention. Our next poll is, I believe it is important to be aware of and try to cater for my learners' learning style. Ooh, okay, now we're getting some, some interesting answers. We've got a couple of really here. Okay, we've got two people who've said really. I'm intrigued. Why is this the case? Difficult in practice, and um, yeah, I would say that I'm a little bit skeptical of, of the VAC learning style. I think it's overly simplistic and that we need to include all of these different ways of teaching uh, to appeal to the different senses and to, to appeal to different learning styles, yes. But I think we pay a lot of lip service to this idea of, oh, I'm a visual learner. And um, we learn different things in different ways and we need to have it repeated and reinforced. Exactly, not everyone in the class will have the same learning style as Amanda said there. So uh, it's important for us to be responsive and to include different techniques, different activities, to keep experimenting with these different things. Um, and also, if you're going to do a needs analysis when you start your classes, or if you're going to do a learning styles questionnaire, then you need to take this into account. Otherwise, it's just a waste of time really. So we do need to, to pay attention to these things, but we also need to act on that information that we receive at the start of the course too. Um, otherwise, what's the point of doing it? One-to-one and -one in small groups um, where learning styles is important. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. You have to uh, change to what that individual or small group need or you won't succeed. Poll number four is, I know about my learners as people. Okay. Oh, there's, there's one really there. Is that who's playing devil's advocate there? I think from a humanistic point of view, we want to we want to know our, our learners as people. We want to feel that we know them. Um, but unfortunately, for me at least, I've run into the situation recently where I have a group of adolescents, a group of 15-year-old teenagers basically, and I found out that I knew very little about them in fact. That uh, one of the white Justin Bieber, and I was obsessed with some guy from One Direction. You know, but very trivial things. Maybe I remembered what school they went to, but I really didn't think that I could answer uh, positively with this statement. I know about my learners as people with that particular group. And lots, of, yeah. The more classes you have uh, with lots of different kids or lots of different students. Some people want to share about their lives, others don't. So it can be, uh, it can be quite difficult there to do that. Our next poll, I'm hoping for this uh, a bit more controversy here with this one. I use translation in class. Mm -hmm. All what we've got one always. Few nevers and a lot of rarelys. Yeah, Dan, I'm sorry I forced you all into the uh, 
I, I'm forcing you to take a stance today. I re deliberately removed the sometimes option uh, for that reason, so that you'd be forced to take a more extreme position. <laughs> okay. Um, if it takes too much time to explain, yeah. Um, basically, I'm re-evaluating this one at the moment myself. I'm reading some research. Uh, it's, it's called Own Language Use in ELT, Exploring Global Practices and Attitudes, uh, which was a, a recent research paper. And it was looking at the different reasons why L1 may, may be useful in the classroom as well. Um, not necessarily to explain whole concepts, but in terms of things like rapport building, of switching between the languages, simultaneous translation, uh, different cultural uh, values that may be attached to these things. So again, you, you know, I, I'm not sure how I feel about this one right now, so I'm in a process of re-evaluation with it. And uh, I would say, you know, I would never throw it out entirely, but, but there are situations when it's much easier to translate a word, you know, if it's a daffodil or a, you know a hedgehog. It's not, if you don't have a picture, then translate it. It'll save time as well. Okay, and concept checking exactly. What's the word for that in Spanish? It's a nice, simple way of uh, of getting to the heart of the issue. You've explained the concept um, in English, and now you're just quickly checking before moving on. And also the multilingual classes, yeah, with you in, in Scotland, Andy, uh, certainly much harder to do. And you also have to have a, a good knowledge of the different L1s that are there as well. You, you need the language skills to be able to do this as well. Our last poll for us here <laughs> is, I believe, in explicitness of purpose, showing learners why you're doing a specific activity. Oh, and thank you for ha to Hannah for posting that link um, about the own language use paper. It, it is interesting reading if you'd like to click on that and, uh, as I say, take it away with you for some reading later on. Okay, so explicitness, explicitness of purpose. Why is this a good thing? Okay, Sarah, I like that. I asked them why they think it's useful. Yeah. I think that, I, again, eliciting, asking them to reflect on why we've, we've been doing this particular activity. I mean, hopefully nothing that we do in the classroom has been left to chance. We have you know, put it into our lesson plan for a specific reason. And so uh, they're asking them why we might have done it and asking them to reflect on the learning process would be a useful thing to do as well. Yeah, exactly. And they, I think they do, Jordan. They like to know why they are doing this and that. And if a student asks you, you know, why are we doing this activity or why do we have to do this activity, then we should have a good answer. Uh, if not, perhaps it's time to reevaluate why we're doing it in the first place. Okay. So moving on to the cycle of my teaching career now. Uh, the idea for this came from uh, this book, Readings in, in Teacher Development. And um, it has some timelines uh, of different teachers' teaching careers. Um, it's a very interesting exercise to do, just with your teachers in your school or your staff room. Quite fun, or um, I, I believe we'll be doing it in our session here this Friday in Buenos Aires. So get your drawing skills ready, everyone here. And here is the cycle of my teaching career. Here, yeah, they are my graphics, aren't they beautiful, Andy? Uh, as you can see, I spent a lot of time on this slide. Uh, but here is the cycle of my teaching career, and I'm just going to talk you through a bit uh, some of the ups and downs uh, that I've had here, really. Uh, as you see at the top, we start off with the native speaker block. Uh, basically. This is when I learnt to elicit because I knew no grammar whatsoever. I spent a year teaching conversation and bluffing my way around things. 
and Asif says here, who here can explain present continuous? I didn't even have the basics of a grammar foundation at, at this point in time. So um, it, it was uh, a learning experience, shall we say, but I, what I did come to learn when I got my next job uh, for the fast food chain, which had a very specific style of teaching, as you see here, it says PPP, which I know you all know stands for. You can type it in the box for me. A little mini test for you. Yes, thank you, Hector. Prez, Pack, Prod. Um, it, it was very much this. So at least it, this helped me to get my grammar under control. You know, I had uh, the Streamline series, which is a book that's still very close to my heart. Good old Streamline. I don't know if anyone there is familiar with it. And uh, on the other side, the teacher's book pages. And here it had the grammar explanation. Ah, oh, yes, Sarah, I love it too. I can almost still, uh, still recite whole lessons from this because I did them so frequently. Uh, but it did, this one taught me how to drill, uh, which was an interesting thing there. And basically uh, also to react to the students' needs on a much more individual basis. Okay, uh, uh, after working for this school for about three years, I started to think, God, I'm bored. And I had to start experimenting. Um, I'm sure it wasn't as long as three years, but basically I just started to explore things and play around a lot in the class and classes. Um, and this is why I started to experiment. I also, I think it was in around 2000, had a day's training session on a revolutionary new technique, which was known as TBL, the task-based learning. So. Um, that was you know, a huge revolution for this school to, to introduce this as an idea. Um, Hector says, has, why has drilling gone out of fashion? I believe it's coming back in again, though. That's the good news. Drilling's back with a vengeance. All right, from there, I went to do the CELTA. I thought I needed to give my, what I had worked out for myself some sort of theoretical basis. Uh, in teaching, I think we do tend to come for come at it from one extreme or the other. I've, I've seen this many times where, like me, I come from a very practical, hands-on uh, way of doing things. And I, I often feel I'm a little bit theory light and that I need to continue uh, backing up my practice and my experience with more theory. Whereas other people may come from a very theoretical perspective and, and they need more work on that hands-on and the, the, the variety of approaches or activities and techniques that they use in a classroom. So it is a question of balance. And uh, I, I still uh, am working on finding what this correct balance is as well. Uh, as you see, here's my CELTA, where I went to lovely IH Budapest. And uh, this did allow me to, to put the terminology onto what I kind of worked out for myself. And as you can see there, we've got a lot of these initials uh, we've had PPP already, but we've got our TBL, TTT, CLL, and TPR. Would you care to, to take a guess at what they are? Actually, I'm sure a lot of you uh, already know these. Again, a mini test for you. Great, Christina. We've got our TPR. Oh, we've got CLL here. and. CLIL is another very popular buzzword at the moment, I think, as well, Esther, uh, which is also one that great. Hannah, community language learning was the CLL. TTT could be teacher talk time, or as Anastasia put it there, teach, 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 test, teach, which uh, I particularly like as a teaching method because it allows you to, to really get to the heart of where the student learning currently is without having to waste time on what they already know. There's no D. Oh, wait, Sarah, the D's coming. The D's coming. Um, the, there wasn't any of the D on my self of course either, really. Well, so here I was in Budapest, and here I had my, what I would say is my first real advanced class, because uh, my classes in Japan were pretty much upper intermediate, um, was the level, and I, I didn't really realize this. So I got off my CELTA, 
and I had my advanced class disaster where the first lesson went very, very badly. One student complained uh, by the second class. He'd managed to, uh, you know, to, to get all of the students on his side, so they all sat there stony-faced. And um, from that point on, it was very, very hard to try and get them back again. Um, it was a nightmare. I don't know if you've ever had a, a nightmare class like this, but it does always stick in my memory as just a, a most, the most uncomfortable six weeks of having a group that I've ever had. Um, and it's very hard to come back from, from this situation, I think, where you've started off on the wrong foot. And so my rule of thumb these days is to pitch higher than where uh, the students are, so, so to make sure that it's much more challenging and so that they go away and welcome to teaching teenagers. Yeah, uh, to, to, to pitch it higher so that they're challenged in some way. And I, I, I find that that helps to avoid uh, these terrible, disastrous moments. All right, moving on then to the Delta. Uh, can we have a show of hands here? Who has got the Delta? Can we have some hands up if you have, have take, got the Delta? There we are. We've got. Dana, lovely. Christina, Lara. Of course, Hector. Okay. Can I have a, another show of hands now for people who are considering taking the Delta at some point in the future? Okay, oh, Sarah, well, two out of three, that's, a, that's the beauty of things these days as well, isn't it? That you have that ability to, to do those parts that you, you know, that you want to do. Okay, and great, so we've got some people here looking to do the Delta at some point in the future, and I hope what I say uh, now doesn't put you off terribly, um, but I really didn't have a very pleasant Delta experience, I must admit. You see here, Two strikes, three strikes are out. I started off again very much on the wrong foot here. Uh, my first assignment was, fa was a fail. I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing, but I, whatever it was, I was doing it wrong. My second observed lesson was a fail. So I, I spent the whole course basically thinking, well, you know, if I mess up this one, that's it. It's game over. And it, it, it put a whole lot of stress on the whole process, really. Um, I felt that uh, I had to sort of change my, my teaching to be doing it a, a particular way, uh, which these days I can see that I, I learned so much from it and, you know, I feel that I could walk into any classroom uh, with very little preparation and often no preparation as director of studies and I have to cover classes with, with very little notice. But I can walk into a classroom and give a competent class, and this is really a result of the of the Delta. Uh, however unpleasant my experience with that was, do students really notice the difference between a Celta and a Delta teacher? Very interesting question. I'd like, I think that's some interesting research that, that we should uh, look into there. But the Delta, yeah. So after this Delta learning had to kicked in though, I thought, right, I know how to teach now. Great, this is it. And so then I had my one-to-one -one no go and I and as I think Dan mentioned earlier, uh, that you know in these small groups or one-to-one -one situations you have to be very responsive to learning styles and what the student wants. Now I went in there, the student said, you know, 70 year old man from hearing problems, very powerful company owner. He said, I want listening and grammar. So I thought, great, I know how to do listening and grammar. And I tried and pulled out all my, my repertoire of, of techniques and um, you know activities. And this is what you want. No go at all. It was a bomb. And again, I, I kept trying something different each week. It's like, OK, I was so frustrated. How am I going to, to find a way of, of us working together? And I was on the point of giving up when um, basically we just started answering these emails and I, 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 you know, I began teaching them about how to download podcasts and to do some, 
uh, more digital literacy stuff with them. And really, uh, from that time on, it all improved. So it was really breaking away from this delta mold of, OK, this is what good teaching is. Uh, so basically, the bottom line here is that all of these uh, bumps along the way uh, revolve around one thing, really, and that's re-evaluation. Each of these sort of mini crises uh, have led to some kind of rethink on, on my beliefs. And now I think it, it also happens on a much more weekly or, or daily basis as well. Okay, so examining beliefs. Okay, I, I decided I'd just quickly scribble down my top 10 uh, learning beliefs. And these were the first 10 that came to my mind. So, number one is that interest is key. Now, we mentioned earlier about, uh, I think, about motivation or engaging your students. I know Andy Scott, who is my wonderful ex-colleague, uh, always said, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Andy, but that it's uh, impossible to motivate students. You can engage them. You can engage them in the lesson, but the motivation has to come from within. So, uh, how do you engage your students? Mm -hmm. Personalising with the topic, yeah, I think that's always always a great rule of thumb there. Localising, I, I think that could be done a lot more. Um, oh, Julia's just written something in Russian that I can't understand, but I would love to. Real life examples, yeah, all of these things related to the, the context here of personalisation, of, of you know lifting it off the page in some way, perhaps with video, uh, with visuals. <laughs> there we go. Uh, authentic materials, localised context, yeah, all of these things can really help to to improve their engagement and. Yeah, you can't fake enthusiasm either, Dan. I think that's a, a good point too. If, if you're in, enthusiastic about the lesson, that enthusiasm can really go a long way towards you know, taking the students on that journey with you <laughs> without trying to be too down. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, you said before, someone said about the, the the D word, the D word, and here, what is the D word? You can't have a session really in the international house without the D word coming up. There we go. Dogma is the D word indeed. And Sometimes I think, you know, we, we get caught up in a lot of gimmickry, um, you know, the whistles and the bells and and that we, we have to make a game out of everything. And really, you know, why can't we just engage with the language and the communicative process, getting to know each other uh, as human beings uh, and stripping away a lot of that, uh, you know, in, in the, uh, what, the fun for fun's sake, I guess. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I, basically, I disagree with the hype that surrounds dogma, but I do agree with a lot of its basic principles. And you know the materials light that that we need to interact with each other. We need to interact with the language, and we don't necessarily have to make a game of it unless we want to, and unless our students enjoy that. Uh, because again, not all students do enjoy games, and it's important that we don't enforce or force our own teaching and learning beliefs onto our learners, and we pay attention to what they want as well. And so the, the idea of you know, the revolutionary Dogme uh, 95 manifesto, this was just a year before I began teaching in, in 96 as well. So, so I, uh, although I disagree with the hype, I think it does fit a lot of my teaching beliefs very nicely. 
listening to your learners and responding to them. So you have a lovely point there. And then repeating it a million times so that they learn it as well. Um, how many times have you learned something by doing it once? If you did, it must have been something very simple, I imagine. So repetition is, is a key element. You know, we mentioned earlier drilling. Uh, I think it is coming back into to fashion actor, the drilling. Um, audio lingualism, where that came from. But basically, you know, for anything to be learnt, we need it in different ways. We need to, to we need to say it, we need to hear it, we need to you know, to work with it in different ways until we've mastered it in a way. Shiva, please type your question uh, into the box there. We'll, we'll be happy to answer it if we can. Right. Achievable challenge. For this one, I, I go to our good friends. Oh, sorry, Shiva, please type it again. We'll, we'll try and answer it. Oh, what if they aren't interested in anything? Is that possible? Can students not be interested in anything? I think everyone somewhere deep down has a secret passion of some sort. And uh, it may just be a matter of digging and digging. I, I, it does make it hard work if, that's, if they're not very upcoming about it. But um, yeah, boys, girls themselves, there must be something. Everyone's interested in something. You know, I have a collection of, of crazy horror dolls. Um, you know, maybe, maybe that's, uh, it, it would take a very long time. Perhaps it's opening up about yourself a little bit too and to say, okay, this is what I'm passionate about and seeing if that, uh, if that passion can, can be transferred and if they open up and ask you uh, or, or start to tell more about themselves too. Mm -hmm. And it can be cruel to pretend you're not interested in things, but if you find, if you find what it is, they can't mask their enthusiasm. All right, achievable challenge. For this one, I turn to, to Mr. Scrivener and Adrian Underhill with a particular meme, um, which is the demand high meme. Um, I've also felt in observations uh, that sometimes we, uh, you know, we've dumbed things down a little bit. Students are not sufficiently challenged. If it's too easy, why bother? Uh, and particularly the case with teens, I, I like to up the ante here to make it harder uh, because if not, you know, what's the point? We really need to challenge them more here. And the, uh, this is time for my confession as well. I'm quite naughty when I'm doing level tests, uh, placement tests a lot of the time too. If I think a student is not quite at a level uh, but really wants to make that effort and needs that challenge in order to, to grow, I think I am not the person to tell them that they can't. And so perhaps I cause my, cause my teachers here a little bit of trouble on occasion by putting students in a level that is a little bit out of their reach. But uh, I, I believe that you know, we do need challenge and particularly if, if you decided for yourself that you want to do something, you, know, you shouldn't be necessarily held back from doing so. Okay. Uh, yeah, interesting, Sarah. Play it safe in observations. Um, I, I kind of wish people wouldn't play it safe in observations. I think good classroom practice can be, uh, you know, if you've got the basics down and you, you've got your classroom management in place, uh, that's evident. And really, it's, it's much more enjoyable to see people exploring and to experiment with things that may go a little bit wrong. But again, something to, to speak to your, your DOS about and we'll again be looking at these a little bit later on but I better move on through my slides or we won't get there. Let me think, what do you think this slide refers to? Absolutely, thinking time, brainstorming, yeah, getting those ideas together so that you know students actually have something to say, maybe they haven't I got the world knowledge to prepare them for this particular topic and they need some, some time to reflect on it, some processing time, some reflection time. Okay. 
and also to scaffold their new learning onto what they already know. So that, that's why I, I am a fan of the test, teach, test, so that we can find out, you know, okay, what do they know about this? What are they still having trouble with? All right, let's take it from there. And different processing speeds. Yeah, I'm terribly slow as a learner. I need loads of processing time, um, which I used to do in my Spanish classes by copying things down very, very slowly because this was my processing time. So also in the classroom, uh, consider the role of, pro of, of copying time because this quiet individual time can really help a student to, to reflect and you know, it, it gives different people that different time that you've mentioned there. So consider the role of copying time in your classes too. Okay, hey, remembering is not understanding. Here I'm referring to a very famous taxonomy um, by a, a certain gentleman named Bloom. And we have our taxonomy. So we've got remembering is not understanding. And here is our, yeah, our taxonomy, Bloom's taxonomy, just to jolt your memory here and the higher order skills. So, you know, first we need to remember something, then to understand it, then to experiment with it so that we're applying it in different situations, you know, getting our hands dirty. So we need to, once we've understood the concept of it, then we need to, to put it into practice in some way. And this is in the applying stage where we're beginning to, to make mistakes with it and, and get our, our heads and hands and mouths around it as well. Then moving on to analysing and the more creative skills. So basically I think in the classroom what we need to avoid doing or to be careful of doing is to say, okay, here's the presentation of some new language. Now I want you to, you know, I want you to write a story with it. I want you to, to do a more critical or creative task without having done the, the foundation work first. Uh, another pedagogy, or based on, on this taxonomy, for those of you who like your, your tech toys or your iPads or tablets and that kind of thing, which I certainly do, is the pedagogy wheel. And basically, this is uh, a number of different apps or programs that you can look at uh, to work with these different different skills that we have here. So uh, well worth exploring some of those if, if you like your tech tools. And here, whilst I was looking for some images there, I also came across this learning pyramid. What do you think of this? So the learning pyramid and average student retention rates. I'd like to hear your thoughts. Mm -hmm. so demonstration would have a, a higher rate there. I, I do, I agree with a lot of what I saw here, but I wondered where this information comes from. It says the National Train Lo Training Laboratories, but um, my thought, immediate thoughts on this was that some, some TEFL teacher just made it up to justify what they do in the classroom. I'm not sure that this has any real scientific basis. So, um, yeah, perhaps the, the, this pyramid may be lacking a little bit in factual information, but I, I would agree, Jordan. Um, I like it as well. Uh, it, it seems, although it may not be strictly 5% for lecture and 90% and of teaching others, we definitely need to follow that procedure of having understood it, because if you haven't understood it, then you can't teach anyone else. All right, I think it all went wrong when... It's time for some reflective practice here. So 
uh, asking students to reflect on why their answers are right, where things went wrong. Okay, and also for, for us as teachers to, to do the same. Uh, at the bottom you'll see here, Al, Alistair Grant, uh, another of our Buenos Aires colleagues, has this wonderful blog. I don't think he's done a recent post here, but it's about reflective teaching, which yeah, I think is a really interesting idea that we should uh, you know, all, all be doing more of, whether it's just a few moments after the class or you're jotting down a few notes of, of what happened in the classroom, or just those questions. Hmm. What happened there? Why did that happen? How would I do the same thing again? How could I do it differently? <laughs> it looks like a dinosaur jaw. Oh, I thought it was a, a beautiful, uh, beautiful reflective cave there. Um, but again, so asking, asking both ourselves and our students to reflect a little bit more. Hey. Okay. Potentially, uh, I'm not sure, is, is this a controversial statement? I certainly believe that all classes are mixed ability and I thought this cartoon uh, sums it up really nicely. In order to be equitable and just, the instructions for the task will be the same for all. Okay, so everyone climb that tree. Uh, I'm sure you've had the, the situation yourself where you've given your beautifully clear simple instructions to a task, you've checked your instructions, you've modelled it, and then one student says, what do we have to do? Okay, so, so this happens to us, I'm sure you've all had the same experience, but maybe, um, maybe there are different ways, or, or some students need to be given instructions in different ways, and so it's this exploration that I'm interested in, um, and this, the, the idea of task differentiation and, and so of mixed ability classes. We all have different strengths and weaknesses. We have different processing times. We have different process, you know, um, learning styles or preferences. So um, it's, it's an interesting one to consider. How can we get the best out of our students working at their own level? And I think that again refers to the demand high mean too. So you might like to watch those talks uh, from the DOS conference um, on the IH YouTube channel, I'm sure, which are very, very, very useful. Okay. And shouldn't we, we think of an average? Uh, is that related to, to teaching to a sort of average level? I think that might be our, our Mixed ability makes demand high challenging, absolutely. But I mean, mixed ability, as I say, I'm not talking about necessarily having elementary in with advanced students, but that you know, cert certain students in the class are struggling with, with the grammar of something, others with the listening. How can we, we teach them and uh, get the best out of them or help them where they're struggling most? Okay, getting to the end of the top 10, uh, we learn by doing. I very, very firmly believe that this is the case. And here there is a famous quote that you may have seen before. It's, tell me and I, anyone know what's missing from the gap here? Tell me and I forget, Hannah, thank you. Teach me and I may, no, it's not believe. Um, so the first one, teach me, and I may remember Ruxanda, great stuff, and involve me, and I. And Gomez has got the last one there, teach me, and I learn. Apparently this is a, a Benjamin Franklin quote. I, I mean, I've heard it attributed to Confucius, to Lao Tzu, and Kung Fu Panda. It's used in a lot of different situations. But certainly, we learn by doing things. We, we need to, to experiment with it. And 
it also refers, I think, back to our lovely pyramid that we saw before, that we learn by doing and we also learn by explaining things to others because it shows that we've understood things. All right, my final teaching belief is no pain, no gain. It doesn't just apply to exercise. If there's no effort, then there's no point. And I think this is one of the things uh, that you've been chatting about in the box here, that um, you know, the, the students need to make this effort. There's only so far we can lead them otherwise without them having to actually invest something of themselves in it. Uh, so no pain, no gain. All right, time to put me under the microscope. So I'm going to send you away to YouTube with a, a five minute video clip of me teaching a class recently. It's my uh, teenage class and it's just the lead into the lesson. So a very sort of typical everyday lesson. Uh, I didn't plan it sufficiently, let's say, but let's say it's just a very ordinary lesson that would be indicative of the way I would teach on an average kind of day. So here are the questions. Um, Shiva, I absolutely, I don't like the, that empty chair between students at all either. It's, uh, it's one of my you know, cardinal sins. You can't have the empty chair. Here are my questions that I'd like you to, to consider while you're watching the video. Um, were the students interested, engaged in what they had to do? Did I try to engage them? And if so, equally. Did I differentiate the task or cater to stronger or quieter students? And were they sufficiently challenged? As I say, uh, this, is, this is just the start of the lesson, so we may not be able to see it all. But at the end of the session today as well, I'll, I'll give you a couple of documents to download. And one is the six short video clips of the lesson in its in, well, a larger section of the lesson. So you can do some peer observation there. Uh, there's a beautiful moment when I completely mess up the instructions and various other chaotic things that take place. But I, I will let you uh, be the judge of that later on. But I'll come back to this slide so you can see it uh, while you're watching. But right now I'm going to send you away to YouTube for the five minutes. So if you can just click on the link here, it's a live link. And uh, I'll see you back in the room in five minutes time. I'll be here in the meantime, of course. Um, but click on there.
Okay, hopefully, uh, hopefully you've finished up there, so if you can start coming back in. And before I, I give you, there are 13 students in the class, so there of situations that I have in this class. Okay, so feel free to, to type in your comments or, or questions there and before I give you my thoughts on it. But 13 students, Jordan. 13 very noisy Argentines. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's interesting, Sarah. It depends on the day. Uh, how long have they been together as a group? They have been together since March of this year, but they've only been with me. Another teacher left, and I took them on from August. So this is just their second month with me. <laughs> and I do quite a bit of shushing. In this case, yeah, they were really keen, but often when I ask them to focus on things, uh, they're, they're not keen at all. And I had an unusual day with them yesterday where I tried to do some reading and they, they, they weren't having it. They really weren't having it. So halfway through the class I just had to abandon what I was planning to do. And uh, we negotiated and they said they wanted five minutes with their heads down on the desk in the dark because they were so tired. And I said, okay, fine, after we do this, we can have some, uh, we, you know, we'll do word formation. And it was incredible the difference that this five minutes of, of heads down on the desk quiet time had. They were suddenly revitalized. Uh, and we, I did turn it into a game as well. We had some spongy letters, word formation, uh, which went down a tree. And it, it was just such an extreme, again, even within the one class. Okay. Nominating some students there, um, I hope so. And I'll move forward a little here so you can see um, what my basic analysis of it was here. Um, come back to us, Shada, there. You can watch the, the videos later as, as well. Um, as I say, I'll send you the links to those so you can watch them in your own time. One minute meditation. Oh, I like the sound of that. And I, I think I'll try that. I'll try that again uh, as well and, and experiment with this because I think that it might be uh, it might be the way forward with this group when they're being you know, not as responsive as I'd like. So how do I measure up um, rapport and use of names? I was I, I was trying to include all the members equally. I think uh, I did shush them on occasion. Um, and, but I also noticed, uh, as you'll see down the bottom in my action plan, that I felt I was, you know, my chair was getting a bit too much negative reinforcement. So my plan is to use the proximity praise to try and turn a blind eye where possible and to, to praise those around her for, for good behaviour rather than giving her that negative attention that she wants. I think gaining their interest in the topic before introducing the book was great. I think you'll see in another section of the video too that um, I say, oh right, now we're going to do this and it relates to some exam practice. They went, oh. So I had them with me until that point and I wondered if I, if I hadn't um, gone into, you know, if I hadn't linked it explicitly to the exam, could I have maybe taken them on this journey without the groans and moans? Um, proximity praise. Uh, is Carol Reed, who is my younger learner's guru, really. She has she explains this very well in some of her talks uh, and also on her ABC uh, blog, ABC of Teaching Younger Learners blog, uh, which uh, hopefully Hannah can dig up a, a link for you there. Uh, it is related to uh, yeah praising those in in the vicinity of this person rather than, than stopping and saying, you know, my team, why don't you have your book out? You instead uh, praise those around and sort of, you know, take a moment just to look at that person who's not behaving in the way you want, but don't say anything about it, and then moving on to others in the group so that they're not, you know, that 
often the, the, the bad behavior in classes is caused through attention seeking and, and they're getting that attention that they want. So it's about uh, you know, not giving them the satisfaction of that really. Um, I, I will say that my, my language focus was very, very weak. I hadn't sufficiently planned this part of it because I wanted them to get it and doing something creative, which as I said before, hang on, don't you have to have to do your analysis and evaluation before you can go on creating? Anyway, uh, the result of this was after it, I, I came away with this little action plan after watching myself, and that was to give each of the students mini tutorials, giving them some work to do in the class and taking them out individually and having that little quiet five minute chat where I took notes, I found out about them a bit more as people, about why they were studying, what they liked, what they didn't, you know, and it was a very useful experiment uh, and experience to do that every now and then. Uh, I did the better planned language work uh, in the follow up speaking lesson when they used the the posters, the speaking tasks that they made. That was the, the part, the second part of the lesson. Proximity plays with my tech and also re-evaluating my use of own language or, or thoughts on own language because you see at the bottom of the screen there's a little angry face with Spanish next to it. So uh, perhaps perhaps I need to re-evaluate that a little bit there. And here, uh, as I say, here are the CAE style uh, speaking tasks that they produced and these were what they then went on to speak about and of course as they had a, had a more personal stake in them, as they'd created them, the result was that they were far more interested than they would have been using the ones in complete CAE. Okay, so those, those are the ones that they've come up with here. That's important. Nice work they did. All right, so coming up to the last couple of minutes here, but something for you to uh, consider is ways of getting feedback on your own classes. So it's just taking a slide a minute to load here, I think. Should be, uh, should be back with us in just a second. So ways of getting feedback. Um, I think these days a lot of telephones have recording devices, whether for uh, the voice or with a camera. So you know you can't rely on that old technology excuse anymore. That you know, oh, I don't have, I don't have the technology. I can't do it. There are plenty of ways of getting feedback without this. One is prevention, self-reflection keeping a blog or a diary or just jotting a few notes in your lesson planning notebook. You can have focused peer observations, asking a peer or trusted colleague to come into your class and to look at a particular aspect of your lesson. We have our formal observations as well and it was mentioned earlier that you know perhaps you're just trying to um, you know fulfill the criteria but talk to your DOS. I think I think you know there's uh, a lot of flexibility to be had there and Observations are to be developmental as well. I think uh, the bosses out there would agree we love to see people exploring and experimenting with new, new things. So talking to your dots, perhaps there are certain elements that you really want to look at there. Record your voice if you're not comfortable getting on the camera just yet. Then listen to it and see, um, you know, oh, gee, I say okay a lot. Or there's a lot that you can tell from the voice recording as well. And there are also student feedback forms or indeed in the very informal feedback in the classroom where you say, hey guys, did you enjoy that today? What did you think of that? And you're, you know, you're continually, once that channel is open, you'll find that you'll get a lot more honest and better quality of feedback as well. On to our next page here. Here are just a couple of examples of things you could use in peer observations. Um, the student feedback forms, Helen, absolutely. Um, give me your email address and I'll very happily send you uh, an example of that. Here is the uh, a peer observation one just done by hand. How often do I interact with different students? And the other one there comes from the Demand High website. And of course, learning teaching, the back of that has excellent observation tasks. Uh, then 
here are some examples of the student feedback. As I said, informal in class. We've got questionnaires. This is an example of one that we hand out a couple of times a year at, at the Institute to get uh, feedback in general. This student has said, I think that we should have more workbook exercises for homework. So there you go. Um, the students may not always do their homework, but they expect us as teachers to set it and to check up on it. It's all part of you know, what the students expect of us as teachers. So interesting to see there. Uh, letters to the teacher. Dear Lisa, I really enjoy this in your classes. I wish you'd do more of this. God, I hate it when you do blah, blah, blah. That kind of thing. And again, those little mini tutorials. I know I'm going a little over time here, so on to my conclusions. And if you click on this link down the bottom as well, there's some very interesting reading. Um, it basically, it talks about the difference between learning and knowing. And when you're in a position of knowing something, it's impossible to learn. You're like the ostrich with your head in the sand there. All other positions are closed because you know it. So now, when I, I think about my teaching, when I think about many things, I stop for a moment and I think, if I, see, think, if I find myself thinking, I know that, I stop myself and try to put myself into a position where I might be more open and willing to learn. So. Um, Thank you all very much for, for coming along here and uh, exploring my teaching and learning beliefs with me today. Um, I'm just going to get those couple of documents ready to get out to you. And as I said, thanks very much. Okay, Lisa, thank you very much. Um, hopefully those documents will be up for everyone to download. Dan is giving you a round of applause. If we could all have a round of applause for Lisa. Lovely, lovely, lovely. <laughs> and if you have any questions, just type them in the chat box or you can email Lisa. Okay, so those documents should be ready soon. Oh, sorry everyone, um, what, this is the time of day that my computer just decides that it really wants to misbehave and I'm trying to find the documents. It's, it's just being a little bit, um, a little bit naughty right now. Okay, it looks like we're having some some luck now. Okay, so see there the first slowly some bits there. 